If you're joining us for the first time, uh, thank you so much. This has been an ongoing series that we started uh, actually exactly six months ago today on March 19th. Um, as we're a tour company and have been unable to give uh, in-person guided tours for the last several months, um, these virtual programs have been a great way for us to uh, connect with our partners, um, you know, keep our staff working and motivated and continue to tell stories. Um, another great thing that it's done for us is allow us to connect with people who maybe, um, you know, we don't get to work with on a day-to-day -day basis uh, with our uh, usual tour programs. And so it's been so wonderful uh, to connect with Teresa um, and um, have her um, help us put together this program today. So I want to welcome uh, Teresa on, who's going to give us a little bit of an introduction uh, to her film uh, before we uh, dive in and actually watch it. So um, Teresa, I'm just going to invite you to turn on your video. Okay. Hi. Hi, how you doing? I'm doing okay, thank you. Yeah. Good afternoon. I mean, afternoon if you're uh, well for you, Andrew. Afternoon, and then afternoon, hopefully to um, to to the guests who are who are tuning in today. And if if you're from another part of the world, please let us know. Be curious to know <laughs> where people are tuning in from. Yeah, yeah. So, um, can you just tell us a little bit about this film? Um, you know, when when you made it, um, and what was the inspiration for it? Sure. So, um, gosh, I I started working on this project probably like 15 years ago, uh, really a labor of love. You know, I've been really interested in documentary film. Um, I studied anthropology in college and, and always loved the idea of like creative nonfiction. Um, and so I've worked on other projects, but then I thought, well, what could I do as a director, right? As a first time documentary director. And I thought, okay, well, maybe something closer to home. And so my dad didn't really talk about his life so much um, growing up when I was growing up, but there would be some hints of like, you know, some, some phone calls with friends from, from overseas. Um, he knows some bad words in Japanese and some counting words. And he would like kid around with my mom because <laughs> my mom is, um, we're all, we're ethnically Chinese, uh, but my mom also speaks Japanese. And so, you know, little by little, he said that he would um, kind of share stories when we were older. And so for me, it was a way that I could interview him and you know when I went home to spend time with my folks also uh, also get to know him more you know so that in addition to current events and topics we could also talk about history and how some of those themes actually uh, come into the present so it was a, a very long uh, laborious labor of love <laughs> yeah. oh Sorry, I just got the opportunity to watch it this week, and it's it's just such a, a remarkable piece, and um, you know, it's it's you can really see that that you know connection uh, with your dad, and you know, telling you these stories in a lot of cases for the first time. So that's it's really amazing. Um, but without further ado, we're we're gonna dive right in um, and share with everyone. Um, every day is is a holiday. So the film is. Um, a uh, little less than an hour long. Um, so I just dropped into the chat here. Um, there is a link. Um, so what we're going to do is rather than broadcast it over Zoom, um, we're going to invite you to click this link um, and watch it on Vimeo and then and then we're going to come back. So I just dropped it into the chat. I'm also going to uh, share my screen here um, so that you can um, also there are other ways that you can access it if you have any trouble um, clicking that link. All right, folks, welcome back. Um, I actually just rewatched the film with with all of you. So that was that was really wonderful and amazing. And we've got some really uh, nice comments coming in. So Bob said it was amazing. And um, Rob here said he said it's an amazing story of perseverance against systemic prejudice uh, and personally defeating it. So if you have um, more questions or comments, please uh, keep dropping them uh, into the chat. Um, but I, I wanted to start off with a question for you, Teresa, about um, the actual making of the film. You know, one thing that you said was that, uh, and you say it in the film as well, is that your father always promised that he would tell you stories when, when you were older. Um, what was your sort of entry point? What were the first stories when you started actually making the film that he was able, that, that he was wanting to share with you? And then which ones were kind of harder to, to get out of him uh, over time? And, and how long was the whole 
uh, you know, process of, of, of actually filming and interviewing him. Yes, well, um, well, uh, thank you, Andrew, again, and thank you, everyone, for um, taking the time to watch yeah. and, uh, and stay for, for this part. So I think um, the process took about, all in all, um, 15 years. Um, and I had been thinking about it for, for longer than that. So I think it, um, it's just a comment to say that uh, if you have a personal project or a passion project, like keep at it. <laughs> I've also heard something else that documentary films um, can take like five to seven years. I mean, it, it varies, right? Some folks can do things a lot quicker and others are more, uh, take longer. And so some of the things that were, were easier to talk about is like, like I had mentioned prior to starting the film, I had mentioned like there were sometimes some some like words that my dad would use or like he would, he and my mom would have this rapport where, where sometimes he would just um, tease her, but he'd go banzai and he'd just like throw his hands up. And, and um, you know, as, as you could see in the film in real life too, my, my dad, um, my dad uses humor at times to, I think, as many of us do, I think to diffuse something that is a very painful, can be a very painful memory or, or when you're in the moment and while life can be very difficult, you try to find the beauty and the humor in a situation, right? And so, um, so I think those were, those were some of the stories that, um, that I was able to capture earlier on. And actually, um, in terms of the way we structured the film, it's, you know, it's, it's chronological. Um, with going back to uh, going back to the camp uh, towards the end of the film, but actually, when I was doing the filming, it turned out that um, my dad wanted to go back to Japan, um, and yes, he we didn't take many family vacations, uh, but that became like the vacation, <laughs> um, and so I started filming that before actually interviewing him with a lot of other you know, other questions about his life. But the reason why we were able to go is that it was a few years after my dad had retired. Um, my, my brother and I were able to take time off from work to, to go. Uh, my mom, because she speaks uh, Japanese fluently, was also able to help us in terms of like trying to plan uh, to go. And so, um, and so that, and, and I was learning how to film. So even though like I had been interning at, at Channel 13, a public television station in New York, and thinking about um, what my career was, and then I moved into uh, electronic publishing. Um, and so when I was figuring out how to do this, I was also taking classes. Um, then I took classes part-time and I was teaching part-time at NYU, um, took class at the New School. I just bring this up to say, then I, I had a camera. Right. So I was like, OK, well, I've got to shoot this. You know, I didn't have money or organizing something to get a different camera person. And it's so personal. So that footage at the end, which is embarrassing to me in the sense of um, it's shaky. Right. It's um, I, I think my dad is laughing when then he, I realized quickly that he is crying. Um, but it was important to keep that in the film. So even though the progression, at one point I had tried to put that part of the film earlier on, but then realized like it made sense to understand a bit more the arc of, of what had happened to him and then put that towards the end. So then over time I would go, you know, and think about a list of some questions. I mean, now we have, so this was also still when StoryCorps was still starting up. Um, StoryCorps is a wonderful storytelling experience, right? And they, um, they had had booths at, at Grand Central Station as well as the booth down in Foley Square. And now they have also questions that um, you can ask to encourage you to ask questions to other people. So as part of this journey too, my dad and I did a StoryCorps together. And so some, um, some of the audio we were able to um, either use um, as examples for me to try to rephrase questions when I was able to then also get him on camera to film. So I think some of the easier questions were, were questions about um, questions about like why did he you know want to go to medical school? Why the questions that were harder were questions like you know and sometimes I had to play dumb if you will and sometimes I actually didn't didn't know. It was questions about like literally on the ship, right, on the ship to go to Japan when you're all crammed in together and, and it's terrible conditions and people are dying. Like, how, 
how do you survive that? Or like, how do you literally go to the bathroom, right? So there are these like macabre, funny scenes. Um, and I had, had, I had asked that more than once. And then the take that we used was the one that I felt like made, you know, made the most sense for, um, for the film. And then over time, I think my dad also had to learn to trust me, which you would think that since we're, at, I thought we were pretty close, that actually he, um, that, that he would trust that I would tell his story. But I think what, what he had finally told me is that over the years, his story sounds so strange that, and he was also taught to like keep his experiences to himself. Um, I've heard from other children of former POWs, especially those um, who, who went back to England, that they had something called guard your tongue, where there was this uh, leaflet that was explaining that like, you survive. So like other people who didn't like, only talk to people within the military about it. You don't share your experiences with the rest of the family. So I think other people in, in talking with, you know, other children of survivors, uh, their parents often didn't talk about it or couldn't, couldn't talk about the experience. And so that led to difficulties within the household, right? Or could have, like my dad would have nightmares sometimes, but you know, luckily he was able to process it in such a way that um, like he was a very loving father. And so, um, so gradually these stories, right? I would try to ask him, it was like, okay, well this day he would talk until he's like, no, no more, I'm done with that story, right? Um, other times then I would try to figure out what other questions to ask him um, about his journey, uh, both in Japan and afterwards. And Ruth actually had a question, which is if your dad ever had the opportunity to have any, you know, kind of therapy um, about the painful experiences that he had or? Yeah, no, no. I mean, it's, it's definitely something where my dad is of a generation, uh, was of a generation where he didn't go to therapy. It wasn't, it wasn't something that was, and, and also I think in the Asian American, experience, it's still very difficult to talk about mental illness and, and depression or, you know, other difficulties, which is something that we should talk about more, right, um, in society as a whole. And so, no. And I, I think that's an experience that a lot of us can relate to, you know, talking, having family members of, of this generation. Um, uh, another thing that really stands out about the film is this amazing collection of personal photographs, um, and of course his diary um, that you were able to incorporate so beautifully into the film. When did you first encounter those? Is, were these things that you were, I know you, you said you learned about the diary later, but had, did he ever show you the photographs or anything like that? Or was that also, you know, a, a, something that you came to learn about in the course of making the film? Yes, so uh, it's, a, it's a really good question. My dad had had a, a scrapbook and as many times as he, he moved, I am really surprised about what he was able to, to keep. Um, he put together a book and then after my brother and I graduated from college, he, um, he like Xeroxed some copies and, and showed us. And it, it kind of had the outline of some photographs and, and some papers that he had kept, right? But he did not, tell me till a few years and he didn't tell my mom my brother until a few years after we started filming that he actually um kept a diary <laughs> so i had already been interviewing him about his experiences and then he like mentioned because i was also trying to figure out the structure of the film and then he he mentioned that he had this, that he was able to keep a diary now i think someone had had asked in the chat where did he get the paper? And I, I actually don't know that. I'm gonna go back and look to see if in my questions, if I, if I had asked him, because it is a small, you know, it's a small sheet of, it's a very small sheet of paper, sheets of paper. Um, and I think he had to hide them. But it might have also been that he felt like it was at a point in his life where he could finally feel more comfortable sharing the stories. Um, and so, yeah, like over the years, little by little, we would see some photographs, but then like there's a point where he shows us, for example, the, the Hershey's. Um, so after liberation, like my dad kept the Hershey's uh, wrapper, which we also didn't see till, uh, till only a few years ago also, that he just had them somewhere. And I, I again, I don't, I don't know why. I think it was just over time that he had to learn to, to both trust the process and, and to say like, 
okay, like he also thought, well, maybe people wouldn't be interested in, in the story. And, you know, like living history is, it's so important. I mean, unfortunately, my, my dad passed away two years ago, and so he's not around anymore. But for me to be able to share with him and, and share with others, I think um, it, it just adds that sense of living history or that first person, right, perspective of what it was really like like to see those packages come down, right? To actually still keep the wrapper because it's so important that like, that you had that sustenance after starving for three and a half years. Um, so. And George mentions here that he says, I can't believe it's been a decade since the screening at the Museum of Chinese in America. Mm -hmm. So your dad obviously saw the film. What was his reaction to the film? You know, for the longest time, I didn't even show him like a, a cut of, of the film or like a 15 minutes, 20 minutes, because it was a, a process, right? And, and um, we screened a work in progress at, at the Museum of Chinese in America. So it was a, a process for me to try to get funding and support for the film. And MOCA was great because um, I got a small grant from the Lower Manhattan Cultural Council and I was able to show it, um, show it at, at MOCA. Um, and so my dad said to me after he saw it, oh, it's, it's true. And I was like, did you think, you know, I'm a documentary filmmaker, like, did you think it wasn't going to be true? And I think it's because he actually went back to Malaysia a number of years ago, and there was one article where there were some mistakes in the article or there was some hyperbole. So I think, um, I, I think that he was just very worried, worried about what it would be, what it would look like. And then at another point in time, after he saw the film again, he had told me that it seemed like um, that I was like a vessel for, for, in a way, for his story. And I think he was more comfortable after he saw also, yeah, it took me, you know, it took me hours and hours to like go home, try to uh, shoot footage, right? Or shoot him at home. And then it was like, okay, well, let's go to Ellis Island or let's do certain things or we'll wander around in Chinatown. So it's about building trust. And I think even with a family member, right? Cause we have, I mean, as much as we get along still the family dynamic, I mean, we fight sometimes. <laughs> and so um, whether it's a subject that you're working with who's outside the family or someone um, who you're related to, there is a level of um, just be doing the research, being prepared and then trying to be open to figuring out why this person may trust you, right? Um, and sometimes he would also talk like when I, when the conversation I thought was almost over, then he would have something else that he would say, which then I might need to ask, you know, at another point at another time. So I think as, as filmmakers and journalists, if we're able to, to try to ask people questions in a couple of different ways, if you have the luxury of being able to interview this person over time, that way you can figure out and get a little more of the story. And what was your mom's role in this, this whole process? So um, my mom is, is quite a trooper, you know, um, my mom is incredibly smart and incredibly passionate and she's very proud of my dad. Uh, and she's also in the, keeps herself in the background a lot. And so, um, so I think, you know, she was very useful, for example, um, when we were in Japan and like uh, translating and talking. And I think, you know, she's a very um, stable, presence in, in my father's life like they were married almost 50 years and so um even though they you know they had their fights as, as you could see in the beginning when my dad is like pointing and my mom's like nagging him <laughs> because she's nagging him because she's like you can't see your face in the photo and I mean it's um she's a good sport in the sense of because this film um mentions her but is more about him right her full personality is not is not in the film um, the snippets that are there are more almost her acting as a foil, right? Um, and, and, and being that like, that like nagging personality, which in a way is good as a mom, right? But sometimes it is, is hard. Um, so, so she, uh, you know, she was just so supportive of, of my dad and, and of my brother and me uh, and, and thought it would be good to, to make the film. Yeah, but she definitely tried to, you know, stay out of the way in terms of filming. So even at the point where she brought the hat out with, when my dad had that hat from Bologna um, from medical school, I was like really happy that she was willing to, to bring it out because she actually doesn't like to be on camera very yeah. much. And did you get the sense that she was also learning you know, new things about your dad's life story in making yes. that film? Yes, 
because she did, you know, she did know that she was, um, that he was a POW and in, in Japanese that term was, is called horio. So she, you know, she knew that, but I think definitely um, like the fact that he didn't share with us till much later that he kept this, you know, was able to keep a few pages in, of this diary. Um, it, it did add, yeah, it, it was, it was interesting also that um, I think sometimes when you're so close to someone as a, as man and wife, to have that other generation. So I think it's sometimes it's the child or the grandchild. And maybe now we're getting to the point, for example, with like Holocaust survivors of like great grandchildren, right? Um, and, and also World War II. It's, it's maybe if, if for those who are still alive, like how you can feel more comfortable with somebody who's of a different generation. So I very much believe in this power of intergenerational storytelling, right? Um, and yeah. And hope um, that other people are able to, you know, continue to collect stories, both right, from, right. you know, in their lives for personal history. And, and speaking of which, uh, we have a question from Hua Su Yang, who says that, um, th first of all, thank you uh, for the gift of sharing your family's story. I just watched the film with my Malaysian Chinese parents. What is your recommendation for steps to take for those of us who want to uncover and tell our family stories? Yes. Um, I, I very much believe in that. I, as I mentioned, I talked about StoryCorps. So there's like a list of questions. What, what I, it's been on my list of things to do is sort of um, put together my own list of questions to, and so I'll post that on my website, let's say in the next few weeks, please, but um, Hwasu, please follow up with me about that. Um, I think that a lot of things take place around the dining room table or take place at a restaurant. A lot takes a place around food. So one thing, even though the environment is noisy, I would say if you want to at least start capturing some stories, and this happened with my dad as well, um, we would maybe start sometimes during during the meal, but but often after after the meal, we would be able to then find a quieter place to to film. But also, it can start without film. If you have um, on your phone, if you want to do voice recording first, I think now with technology. Just start really is, is my main piece of advice. Really just start because you can always go back and try, well, always, you can try to go back and refine, but at least get something down first. And you have to get the person or your family members comfortable with talking on camera. Like for example, with the cameras, sometimes there's a red light that goes on. So in filmmaking class, there's a you know, there's an instruction to, if you can, you might want to tape the red light or you can disable that digitally. So there's some tips like that. And then others is to, if there are families when you're eating, again, I, my advice is like, try to talk about some of these things, but then find, if you can, as a follow-up, a quieter place during dessert or after, can you find a place to interview um, your loved one, right? And then don't be afraid, well, now over Zoom, especially because because of COVID, um, there's, you can use on your Mac, like you can record, right? There are ways to screen grab um, so that you can do this remote recording and have footage that is, whether it's for personal use or you want to do it to share with others, that, that is good enough, not just good enough, that is good, right? And then there's also a way to partner if you have the audio with someone who might be able to do illustrations and this way you could work intergenerationally. If someone's able to do animation or illustrations, there are ways then that folks could do that. Or a lot of us are using podcasts right now. And so audio is a wonderful, wonderful way to be able to edit and share stories. Yeah, and as you mentioned before, the um, the booths that StoryCorps used to have, I did one of those interviews with, with my own mother uh, a number of years ago, which was really an amazing experience. Um, but yeah, they've also created so many more tools to make it easier for you to just do it at home because we all have incredibly sophisticated recording equipment in our pocket every day with our phones. Um, but we have a couple more questions um, as we're, we're running uh, short on time, but this is such a poignant question from George. Uh, he says, what exactly was your father's philosophy in life that allowed him to persevere through so much hardship? Uh, it, it really is, well, there, there are two, two answers to this question. The one really is when he says every day is a holiday. So my dad would say to me um, very often, so it's like when I would go visit him and even when, when we were living at home, my brother and I, it's like, oh, today's another holiday, every day's a holiday. Because he truly did in his, in that diary, you know, when he wrote like every day as a free man will be a holiday, 
just believed it. And, you know, his life was not easy afterwards. Um, yet that was his philosophy. I mean, I guess there's three, two other answers. He's also um, very, he was very religious. My dad converted to Catholicism. And so he had, had has um, this unshakable faith faith in, in God. And so I think for people who are religious, I think um, being able to, to trust in that higher power, um, it was very um, meaningful for my dad. And, and the other is that um, the reason why I have in the chapter titles, those chapter titles are actually phrases actually lifted from the, my dad's diary. So like when he wrote like Mediterranean climate for me, and then he was able to go to Italy for medical school, like, um, in a way, I think he manifested his his dreams and you know worked really hard at it. And so I do morning pages as from the artist way. Like I try to write three pages every day. Um, it's it, it sometimes seems hokey, but I think like when I saw my dad right and read those, looked at those pages in the diary, it's like his philosophy. Also, I think is that you work hard, but you also like you try to plan. And I'm not much of a planner, but like to see him and to see the way that he wrote these things out and wrote his dreams and, you know, um, and wrote, and then to be able to look as like, oh my gosh, like he, he did it. So I think that that, that philosophy truly did, did um, help him. Yeah. yeah, I mean, even if you just take one of those chapters, it's such an amazing story. You know, the story of him in the war. And uh, I mean, what blew me away was the story of him you know, all his various efforts to try and become a citizen of the United States, you know, it's, it's you know, becoming a merchant seaman and then fighting in the Korean War and then lobbying Congress. Uh, it's really remarkable. And then, of course, his his career here in the United States and his family here is an amazing legacy, too. So, um, yeah, it's I think it's such an inspirational story for, for, for everybody. Um, uh, we had another question here from Ruth, uh, which is what what are you working on now? Oh, um, so I'm working on on two items. My ne my next big uh, big personal project is a documentary about a video game designer. And so um, Brenda Romero is a is a video game designer who has been in the industry over 35 years. And she makes board games about difficult historical topics, and she makes um, video games that are like uh, strategy and and shooter games. And um, she's a, a wonderful, interesting character, and so um, and so I I like it. I like her, and I like her her thought process, and I'm investigating that. So that's called Game On, and that's a documentary in process that I'm <laughs> trudging away at. And um, and then I'm I'm working on a, an interactive piece, prototyping it called Bought Broken, and it's a project about um, about intimate partner violence, and it's collecting stories from uh, survivors of objects that were broken in the relationship um, mm. as the relationship devolves. And I'm partnering with some nonprofits and, and hoping that, um, and also individuals, so if folks have stories that they wanna share anonymously or not, because the idea is I'd like to raise more awareness about, um, you know, about, about something that happens all over the world and, uh, and a way to, for survivors, like create maybe a totem, like a virtual totem of these objects that, that's a more meditative um, response. So those are the current projects. Um, and so we, we shared the website for your film, um, but where else can people keep, keep track of the, the work that you're doing? Oh, thank you. So, um, so yes, my, my last name, um, the character is dragon in Chinese, is, but in English it's spelled Lung, L-O-O-N-G. So my website is lung.com. So I have um, most of my, my information on there. Um, I'll put, I still have to put the game work in progress website up, but uh, please reach out to me. Yeah. And then, um, and then I'm happy to also put my, my email there. So I'm Teresa at lung.com. Uh, would love to hear what, what else if folks had some other comments. Um, so please reach out to me. Yeah. Yeah, so we, we just dropped that into the chat. Um, and we're also going to follow up uh, with people later in the week um, with uh, links and other resources uh, related to this, um, to this conversation. Um, so you'll, you'll be receiving that in your inbox um, in, in a couple of days. Um, we, we just had a, well, we, well, we have a couple more minutes um, since we got some more questions coming in. Uh, David asked, why do you think your father wanted so much to become a U.S. citizen? Um, and why didn't he want to return to Malaysia? So, um, 
So I think it was, it was definitely because of his time as a, as a prisoner of war. One is that my dad is a, is pretty adventurous. Um, and so when he heard about like the Grand Canyon or he heard about like so many people had cars in the United States, when, when the prisoners were dreaming and talking about home, uh, the advice that, that he was told, and I think it's in the film is like, um, you know, he wanted to see for himself if it was really true, this, this idea of America. And also I think um, he was able to make friends with, with folks from, from England and um, some Dutch folks, um, but he was also able to really chat with, uh, with the American POWs. And I think there was a level of, because you know, the class structure is different, right? And, and the way that we, um, that we talk about class in the States um, is different. And so, because at that time, um, Malaysia was a colonial, right? He was a colonial troop. And so with the, with the colonies, it's, it's a different attitude. And so I think there was this, this notion of freedom that seemed so interesting to him. And so that's why he was like, really, just really had that urge. And I think, you know, channeled his energy into, into becoming um, a citizen or coming to the States. Yeah. I mean, he has been back to Malaysia, you know, we still have family there. And, um, and it's also a, a wonderful, you know, beautiful country. But in terms of for him personally, where he thought the opportunity was for, for him. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, he wanted to come to the States. Um, well, I, I've had the opportunity a couple of times um, to visit Singapore. Um, we've, we've done some work projects there, and that's why I wore my T-shirt here, so oh, that yeah. the, to the, the POW museum there. And so that I just wanted to give them a shout out. And that's that's something stories that I've heard before and just really resonated uh, with me and, and some of our work in, in in your film. So so again, thank you so much. Um, for, for sharing. Um, and we're really looking forward to your, your future projects. Um, I'll also give a little plug for a program that we did earlier in the year with you to, to um, showcase your, your amazing oral history project that you did with the, uh, the Essex Market um, okay. called Feed Me a Story. So um, we'll also share links to that in our follow-up email. Um, so everybody should, should check that out and, and check out that amazing audio tour that you did of the market. Oh yes, thank you. Yes, it's a project that I, I partnered with um, with artist Laura Nova and also with Sarah Kramer. Uh, and Laura and I have this ongoing project called Feed Me a Story. Yeah, thanks so much, Andrew. And thank you, Cindy, uh, and turn, as Turnstile. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, and I'll just, just mention um, again, uh, if you uh, just joined us for the conversation um, and didn't have the opportunity to watch the film, yet. Um, you can still watch it um, and we'll have a link on our website. You can watch it or I just dropped the link into the chat. Um, it's featured as part of the Black Mariah Film Festival, which is now all online. Um, so you can uh, you can um, also access it, uh, access it there while that film festival is still live. Um, Someone just dropped in here, as he said, <laughs> um, that you did something, a film on Zambonis, is that right? Yes, that is true. I, um, I well, it's kind of, uh, for selfish reasons, I wanted to report about it and I wanted to learn how to drive one. So, yeah, <laughs> so it all became related. So in order to, like, when I got the, when I pitched it, they're like, but you have to drive it. I was like, okay. So, um, so I figured out how to drive. Um, I was actually taught at, um, at Bright Hockey Arena at, um, up in Harvard. And then, um, and then subsequently um, drove at uh, Rockefeller Center at, <laughs> at the ice rink there and, um, and interviewed Charles Schultz and, and put together a, a short film um, and an interactive website on Zambonis, yes, which I would like to update. And I also used music and interviewed uh, the Zambonis, right, uh, with their wonderful um, uh, music, hockey music. Um, and I believe you know you do you know them. Yes, I'm friends with Dave <laughs> Schneider, the uh, yeah, the front man of the the band, uh, the world's only all hockey rock band, the, the Zambonis, who also come from Connecticut near near where I grew up. So uh, it's a uh, yeah, as they said, it's another show in the in the making. Um, well, I would love that, yeah, because their seminal work, I Want to Drive the Zamboni, is, is a real hoot to listen to. Um, <laughs> and they're, they're great. Um, I hear they're great live, but I actually haven't heard them perform live. I only had the, I had the CD. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, I've been to many of their shows, and uh, I've been really missing hockey throughout the, uh, being able to play hockey throughout the, uh, the pandemic. So, um, but again, Teresa, thank, thank you so much. Um, and again, please, um, you know, check out Teresa's other work. 
um, and we'll follow up uh, with more resources. And I'll just mention um, before we go that we do have some upcoming programs that I'm just gonna uh, put on the screen here for a moment. Um, because we have a lot of uh, exciting stuff happening because next week is uh, Climate Week. Uh, New York City Climate Week. Um, so we're gonna have a series of programs uh, on the 21st, 22nd, and 24th, all about climate change, uh, where we're gonna go to Lower Manhattan. We're gonna talk about uh, woodworking and wood harvesting. Um, and we're also gonna visit Prospect Park. Um, another series that we're continuing starting on, uh, or continuing on Monday, uh, is a series we're doing about the history of Thai food in America. So on Monday the 21st, we're gonna talk about cooking Thai food for new audiences. Uh, and then on the 28th, uh, we're gonna look at uh, a couple regions of Thailand and their regional dishes. Um, and then uh, we also have more exciting stuff coming up, including looking at a company that makes adaptive bicycles. We're gonna visit some manufacturers at the Brooklyn Army Terminal, and we're gonna do a, a program, a little workshop about, about photography with our friend, uh, Sean Carroll. So those are some of the things you have to look forward to. So you can visit us uh, at turnstyletours.com. Um, and uh, like I said, we'll be following up with a, with a thank you email that'll have some more links to, to what we have coming up. But I just want to thank everybody so much for joining us again today. I want to thank our regular visitors, um, but I also want to thank so much uh, everybody who joined one of our programs uh, for the first time today. Um, we wouldn't be able to do this uh, without your support. Um, and again, a big thank you uh, to you, Teresa, for uh, joining us, but also for making this, this really remarkable film. It's, it's such a such a wonderful um, document, uh, you know, that, that will really live on, it, not just for your family, of course, but, but for this incredible story of your father's life. So thank you, thank you so much, and thank you, everybody. Thank you very much, Andrew, I appreciate it. Yeah, all right, uh, we'll, we'll see you, uh, we'll see you uh, on, on Monday for our next program, everybody, um, and enjoy the rest of, uh, of your weekend.